Hey, everybody. Welcome to In Soccer We Trust. Make sure you comment, like, and subscribe while we get into it. What is up, everyone? Welcome to In Soccer We Trust. We've got a great show for you guys today. Of course, I'm joined by my man, Charlie Chuck Wagon Davies. And we've got a special guest because there is some tension in the ever-growing uh, soccer uh, world, soccer marketplace. I don't know what uh, the right way to say it is, but we've got a wonderful guest that will be joining us here shortly to sort of elaborate on what is going on um, uh, here on the West Coast. Charlie, you don't get to spend a lot of time here on the West Coast, but I'll tell you, man, there's a lot, a, lot, a lot of teams, a lot going on. We've got beautiful weather here. There's a reason uh, we're all living out here and uh, crammed into a tight quarter, so we're going to get into that here in just a moment. But, Charlie, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. I'm ready. I'm ready to get going. Let's, yeah. let's dive Look, into this. Okay, Charlie, now... I wanted to up the energy a little bit for you, just so you could understand. This is what this is. Th th you know, we we talked about it. Qual, 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 crawl, walk, <laughs> run, sprint, fly. We know you can do some of those things, Charlie. But if you're going to be that host that takes Jimmy's job, you're going to have to just you know uh, uh, go up a few um, decibels to to do this. But listen up, everybody. ISWT is a finalist for the best sports podcast category. Being a finalist is pretty awesome news. But we want to go one step further and win this entire thing, Charlie. You like to win things. Gee, let me think. Um, sure. Yeah, and I like to win things. Jimmy likes to win things. Everybody <laughs> likes to win things. So for those of you that nominated us, thank you so much. We're going to need your help again because some of you will be selected at random to vote again. So check your inboxes because some of you will be asked to cast a final ballot. Now, let's do this. Also, before we get into it uh, any further, Charlie, uh, In Soccer We Trust podcast celebrates the beautiful game of soccer and covers every corner of the U.S. soccer ecosystem from grassroots to the senior national team and everything in between. And Soccer We Trust provides news, views, fan culture, expertise on the red, white, and blue three days a week, including our guest today, uh, which is going to be an amazing one. Now, you can represent your favorite podcast with official In Soccer We Trust podcast gear only found on the CBS Sports Store. <clears throat> store. Sorry, ran out of breath there. Discover t-shirts, mugs, hats, bags, water bottles, and more. Right now, In Soccer We Trust podcast listeners will get 20% off their order when they use this podcast exclusive code, Soccer. 20, or if you read it in Spanish, soccer 20, uh, 20 would be the number. Soccer 20 during checkout. That's soccer 20, and it's only available to our listeners. Head over to store.cbsports.com and shop now. Charlie, before we bring in our uh, special guest, I, I just got to say, is there anything you want to get off your chest before we jump into it here on this beautiful Friday? I'll wait till after our guest, but basically what we're looking forward to this weekend I am hyped. I can't wait to talk about it. Some of the players that's come onto the scene out of nowhere, some players who are starting to, to turn that that um, potential into to form. So we'll get to that later. So let's 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 get our new guests on here. All right. And, you know, obviously uh, we, we like on Fridays now that the season is picked up to make sure that we're giving you your weekend previews of all the Americans uh, playing both uh, domestically and abroad uh, so that you can go into your weekend with a little bit of social currency. But we've decided to flip it a little bit and we're going to start with our man, Dan Rudstein, who's an ex-sports journalist. He's also an ex-British diplomat, which means I don't know how long. He might have security when he pops on, standing in the, in the back corner behind him, just watching and listening to everything that we're staying, saying. But he's also the president of Orange County SC. He's going to be joining us to kind of illuminate what is going on with his club and uh, the LA Galaxy. I don't want to get uh, too far into it, but let's welcome Dan on. To the show, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, uh, yeah, we appreciate your time. No, look, gentlemen, thank you very much for having me on. Um, when you were saying things I've done before, you left out the fact that I once beat Jimmy Conrad at table football. Well, listen, Ooh. Jimmy's not here, but since yeah. it is a win, we'll allow his name to be mentioned because uh, he did. He bailed out on us on a Friday, doing uh, obviously more important things. But because you beat him, we'll count it. We'll include it. Uh, we'll make sure our producers leave that into the podcast uh, just so we know that Jimmy's not untouchable. But Dan. You know, um, Fridays are usual, you know, we usually have people on on a Thursday and Friday we get into our weekend previews and things like that. But as we've started to hear more about what's going on, we didn't want to just kind of give our own take or opinion without ed educating ourselves on what's happening uh, between your club and, and the LA Galaxy and in Orange County. So I guess off the top, if, if you don't mind, just sort of paint the picture of, of, of what it is that you guys are going through right now. Yeah, look, thank you very much for this opportunity. I mean, we're Orange County. We are the champions of the USL, which um, doesn't get talked about as much as you'd expect as the MLS. But, you know, we're, we're still a real team with real fans and thousands of our fans come and watch our games. And our centre-back is an old teammate of both of yours, I think, Michael Orozco. Um, yes. And, um, 
you know, last year we won the championship. We hoisted a trophy in front of all our fans at the championship soccer stadium, Irvine. And we were beginning our preparations for next year. And we don't own the stadium. We are tenants of a council owned stadium. And we were looking forward to planning next year, trying to talk to the council about uh, the plans. And then out of nowhere, we find out of five days notice that there's an agenda on a council meeting where they're going to discuss whether LA Galaxy will be given the stadium for their MLS Next Pro team to play in. And then we would be evicted from our stadium, along with all of the other pro men's and women's clubs in Orange County, which, as anyone who follows football will know, is your stadium is your home. And when the local MLS team tries to get you thrown out, that is a, not a great situation for you, your clubs and your fans. So in, in this scenario, what, what's best case? What, what are you hoping for? Because is this a situation where you both will share this stadium? Is this a situation where you say, hey, you're the MLS side. You already you have your stadium. Don't come over to, to our neck of the woods in, in our neighborhood, our community, where, where we've built, where we put all this work into it and and, and think that you, you deserve uh, our, our stadium to play. And so we'll, we'll, in your mind, what's the best situation moving forward? Well, I think the important thing for us was to try and make sure people understand the situation. So there was a council meeting. We had five days to prepare. We I think that the world of football, soccer on social media took a very clear position as to who they thought should be allowed to play in the stadium in Orange County, um, including Galaxy fans, actually, uh, but also LAFC fans who seemed to rather enjoy what was going on. But fans of teams, you know, San Diego and Phoenix, who traditionally are not our, our friends on the field, were out in support for us. And we rallied and we had 250 people turn up at a council meeting and sit there for four hours. And one after another, they stood up and told the story of why we should be allowed to stay in that stadium. Because, you know, we're Orange County Soccer Club who want to play in Orange County. And a team who literally have Los Angeles in their title probably shouldn't have that same opportunity, particularly when they're seeking exclusivity. Um, and wanting to throw us out. So, you know, the best case for us, of course, is to continue to play in that stadium. We would be happy to share it. I mean, LA Galaxy have played in that stadium this year because they played Cal United in the Open Cup and we share with Cal United. So, you know, we're happy to share as long as everyone's promising to behave themselves. But, you know, the best case scenario is we give our fans what they want, which is more football in that same stadium. Now, to go to the the far other end of the spectrum, can you sort of uh, paint the picture for us of worst case scenario, right? What this means for the club, what uh, what it would mean for the fans that you've been developing, for the community that you spend all your time in, just sort of what is the detriment if you were evicted from 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 this? Uh, kind of what would be the the sort of I guess domino effect? Uh, and, and and I believe regardless, you guys will will, will find a way to do what's right by by the club and the team and the fans and, and the community, but it has to have some, some repercussions in terms of, of how you go about your day-to-day -day business, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that there's, there's different layers to this, obviously from a fan's point of view, and obviously I know you guys obviously played at the top level, but you're also fans of football and you know what it's like to walk into a stadium and be there with your friends and your family and make those memories that you make in sport in a way that just it's impossible to replicate anywhere else. And we want to give our fans the chance to do that. But actually our club, you know, obviously we, we do happen to be the current champions of the league, but our business model as a club is to find good, talented young players and help give them opportunities elsewhere. And I know obviously on the show, you talk a lot about the Americans in Europe. And although he's not at the top level yet, Kobe Henry, who's the, you know, the under 20 centre back, we sold him to Stade de Reyes in France as part of that journey we send we want to send players on and we've sold players to Rangers in Scotland. We've sold them to Wolfsburg in Germany uh, and to teams in Sweden as well. So for us, we're actually trying to help American soccer and having a soccer specific stadium and a great setup where you can create this pathway for players to come through. There's something really important there that you can do with the amazing facility we've got both the stadium and all the training facilities around it. So I think it's, it's, you know, it's for the fans, but it's also, I'm not going to say it's the future of American soccer, but it's a part of that journey that American soccer is going on. We want to be part of. Look, we're not thinking about other venues at the moment. We are determined to solve this, work with the council and get 
what we need, which is staying in that stadium. The club won't go anywhere. You know, if we have to leave, we'll find somewhere else to play. But for now, it's can we stay in that stadium, give the fans what they want and give our, our players now and in the future what they need? It is Would there be uh, any consideration for developing your own stadium at some point? Or has that always been, we're, we're just going to find a stadium that's already there for us to, to make our home, which you already have. But in case of LA Galaxy win and now you're evicted from that space, would there be plans to build your own stadium? Or is this like a, we, there's enough stadiums in, in LA, in Orange County that we can find and, and make our own. Yeah, and Dan, just for, yeah. for context of that, by the way, and sorry to jump in on top of Charlie's question, it, USL as a model has looked very much towards, and maybe not so much at the championship level, but towards real estate projects that create economically viable or sustainable clubs. So, it, you know, I, I guess to follow up on top Charlie's question, is that is that an option or, or something that you've considered? Yeah, and, you know, you're both absolutely right. I think and this is very easy to say this as an English person because of every team in England plays in a football specific stadium. There's no sharing with cricket grounds, but you know, when I first started work in the USL, watching our team play away games at baseball parks um, or university facilities where there isn't grass, it it's not a, a brilliant look for the league. And obviously it's a growing league and, you know, we're off to play Tampa this weekend uh, in a rematch of the final of the USL championship from last year. But, you know, it's a, it's a baseball stadium. And I think, you know, for USL to grow, for football to grow, more soccer-specific stadia are going to be needed. I think, you know, in the medium to long term, I think it has to be part of the plan. I mean, obviously, building a stadium is not a cheap endeavour, um, so which is why a lot of teams haven't yet done it. It has to be a consideration for us in the future. Um, but for now, you know, we're not, we're not going to build a stadium in time for the first game on March the 1st. So we want to secure our stadium in the short term. And then I think we have to look at versions of that for the medium to long term. What is, uh, what's the process, I guess, from here to, to decision? Because time is going to run out quickly. Is there a voting process? Is there a lobbying process? I mean, who holds the power or the cards to sway this decision? Yeah, so there, there's... You know, unfortunately, with the way these things work, it's a little bit opaque. But, you know, at the moment, there was a council meeting. This was on the agenda, it came off the agenda. And whether that was due to fan pressure or legal letters were written, it, it came off the agenda. But that doesn't solve our problem for next year. We are seeking meetings with the council to talk about what this can look like for next year and for beyond. There will be another council meeting at some stage, whether it's on the agenda or not. I imagine that we would like to see our fans there. I mean, 250 people turned up at the last one. Um, when we know whether we need to rally the troops again, I imagine that we would want even more fans to come down and support us at that council meeting and just try and make sure the council understand how important this stadium is to our club. So, you know, it continues. We just have to keep this, you know, out there in the public sphere and just keep talking and trying to get the city to come and talk to us and hopefully get what we need. And, you know, we're grateful to you gentlemen for giving us the chance to talk about it today and the football community more broadly for their continued support in our battle to keep a big club from taking a little club away from their own stadium. Well, we're going to see a big club versus a little club in the U S open cup final uh, soon enough. In, in your words, how do you see USL, in, in the future, how have you been able to find those players that have fallen through the cracks? How have you been able to reinvent some of the players who were professionals playing in MLS, playing in Europe, coming back, and maybe just things weren't working for them, and all of a sudden they find themselves in USL and they they find their the best version of of themselves again. So, how have you seen the USL develop, and and what do you think that the future looks like? You know, I think the USL is is beautifully positioned in terms of its ability to take players forward uh, in terms of that journey to Europe. So, you know, if your choice is playing in, you know, an MLS academy um, with maybe no chance of making it through to the, to the first team or come and play in the USL, play against grown men and, you know, be a young player playing alongside, you know, former US national team player Michael Orozco, but also, you know, all the things that you know as a player – Playing with men is not the same as playing with other college-age kids. So I think the development cycle for the players 
you can get a lot of value from the USL. And the scouts from Europe, they want to see that. They don't necessarily want to see somebody who's played college. They want to see them having played against men. And the equivalent in England is, uh, you know, David Beckham went on loan to Preston North End and Harry Kane went on loan to Lake Norian. That's how they develop them, by sending them to lower level to get that, to get that, sort of battle with older players and learn all the dirty tricks and all the things. Be what it, see what it's like to be in a locker room with grown-ups, you know, all that sort of stuff. So USL is perfect for that. And so, you know, we've shown that with Kobe Henry. We've showed it with Aaron Cervantes, who we sold to Rangers. Give them a chance to play men's football, first team football in games that matter. And then that gives them a chance to learn their craft and for European scouts to see them and come and take them. So, you know, obviously we're doing it. We're not the only team in USL who want to deploy that model to just give that next tier of players in America a chance. Well, we saw, you know, previously with uh, a couple of players coming through uh, the New York Cosmos when NASL was, was was around, and you could see a little bit of a different model of them trying to get players, uh, you know, a, as a viable option uh, abroad, especially the young age, is is – Signing and selling a part of the club's uh, specific philosophy? Is that part of the development process of getting them in earlier, getting them younger, sort of nurturing that talent, and then now giving them a, a clear pathway? Because contractually, it seems like contracts differ quite a bit between USL in terms of your ability and freedoms to to move players or, or the advantageousness of that versus Major League Soccer. A hundred percent. And I think that's the key thing for us. It is, frankly, it is signing and selling. We are, you know, we shouldn't be ashamed to be a selling club. Um, there are plenty, even in England for a while, Southampton, who were in the Premier League, were known as a selling club and passing players through. My my team back home is AFC Wimbledon, and we are very much a, a selling club. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. Now, last year, we, we definitely hit the jackpot because our aim has always been, you know, can we compete in our league? Can we win our league while having that dual approach of having a team who are winning on the pitch, but also that development? So actually, Kobe Henry playing centre-back alongside you know, a veteran like Michael Orozco helping him learn. They did enough together that we we won our championship, but also it did enough for Kobe's career that he went and set a new USL record, but being transferred to the top league in France where he could be marking Messi or Neymar by the end of the year. So I think it definitely works at this league. And that is our model. Compete on the pitch, yet the young players get playing time with senior players, help them develop. And we promise them, we say to them, come and play for us. We will give you a route to Europe. That's legitimately part of our recruitment strategy. And we've sold four players to the top leagues in Europe, which is obviously more than any other USL team. And if you look at our next level of players, there's a handful who may well make that journey soon. Well, I have to say congratulations on on developing players. I mean, Michael Roscoe, you can give him my best. He he got a red card in our last game in the Olympics um, against Nigeria. Um, so I'm sure he remembers that. But uh, I, I'm curious, in November, England, U.S., what's the result? And what and, and which players in your mind do the, the U.S. need to, to, to build around to, to, for them to have success in this World Cup? Yeah. Uh, you are not the first person to ask me my views on that. Um, you know, obviously, America and England have an interesting history in friendly games and in competitive games. Um, I, like, You're an ex-diplomat. England and the U.S. have just history, period. You know, like, let's not, you know. Um, I would say that at this World Cup, which obviously should have already taken place, but is in three months' time, I think it's too soon for America um, in terms of going deep into the knockout stages. I think we'll win the game against you. Um, I think you'll beat Wales. Not sure you would have beaten Ukraine, um, but I think you, you'll beat Wales. Um, and I think you'll beat Iran. You pronounce it Iran. Um, I think I think we'll both beat Iran. I think we'll go through as one and two from the group. But we mm -hmm. will probably sneak a 2-1 victory over you guys uh, I don't think anyone in the. I don't think there's <laughs> one person in the United States that would say I don't agree with you or I I'm I'm okay, I'm not okay with that. So if if the U.S. advance second place in that group, well done. But I think the interesting one will be four years later. I think mm -hmm. you know I'm not sure America will win it, but your chances of going deep into the knockout partly because you get that 
bump of being at home, which obviously the only time we won a World Cup was in 1966. But our Lionesses just won the European Championship the other day. Yeah. It does make a difference being at home because of the crowds and because of the travel, but also just for the development. You know, you've got you've had more Americans in the Champions League in the last year than ever before. The fact that the players are going the right way. So it's not just one or two players over there in marquee roles. You've got a handful of young players all playing in these big clubs. And you cannot underestimate what you learn by being in those big clubs. And, you know, with all due respect to the MLS, you know, you have to be playing for the Barcelonas and Juventuses and Chelsea's of the world. And you need, if you can have the majority of your players playing in those sorts of teams, then that's when it starts flipping and then America become real contenders. I like that. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna shi- uh, I'm gonna to shift this conversation back a little bit. You mentioned that you're, you're, a, you're a, a Wimbledon fan, AFC Wimbledon. Mm. You yourself then have gone through the controversies that you went through as a fan um, of, of the club being moved, renamed. Uh, I mean, do you feel a little bit of what you're going through now? Uh, not, not really apples to apples at all, but in terms of just what it means uh, to a fan base to have a little bit of that insecurity. Do you feel like you you've experienced that now and kind of take a different approach than you might otherwise, if you're, you're a fan who hasn't gone through that? So that's a brilliant question. Heath. I think I, I posted something on LinkedIn the other day about the fact that I'm not comparing it to AFC Wimbledon, but when something that's non football related has happened to your team, it's extraordinary what that does to you. So obviously we had a very extreme version of it in England, um, but um, it's happened to lots of teams, to Blackpool, to Derby County, people having something non-football affecting their club's ability to perform is the is the worst possible thing that can happen to you. Um, and this isn't comparable to our club, you know, literally being taken away and having to start again at the 13th level of football. But as someone who's seen a version of that, I definitely feel some empathy there. And what I think was so amazing is in this four-day window between finding out about the council meeting uh, and then the council meeting taking place, you know, the football community really rallied. Everyone could feel a version of this. So teams were sympathetic, like San Diego and Phoenix, um, but like Columbus Crew, who've had some issues, came out. Detroit, who've been through a whole load of stuff, came out. And they were sending messages of support because it's. I think it's a universal thing. The language of football is just let me go and make memories at my stadium with my team without money and politics getting in the way. And I think even though obviously, you know, I'm president of the team, it's my job to do this. Just as a fan, everyone understands what it means when somebody's trying to take something away from you. And I think that's been amazing for us. How have the players handled it in in particular? That's a a great question. And, you know, you'll know as a what you both know as players in the locker room, front office don't tell you a lot of things because they don't want you to be distracted from the business that you're, you've are you got to undertake, which is winning football matches. But for this one, the players were informed of what's happening. And I think what was really interesting for us, we were playing Phoenix three days after the council meeting. And obviously Phoenix are our biggest rival. We don't have a brilliant record against them. We're in a battle for the playoffs and we needed to win that game. Richard Chaplow, our coach, had seen on social media the video we posted of our fans at that council meeting, which had little excerpts of players, uh, sorry, fans speaking at the meeting. And he specifically asked that the players see that video immediately before that game. And as part of it, there was a 10-year-old girl called Charlotte Eldridge who spoke at the council meeting, which was incredibly brave to stand up in front of those people. We made her honorary captain for the night and she walked out with the players. And I think that combination of the players being seen, the power of the fans supporting them and seeing that girl sort of be among them. I mean, that might not be the only reason we beat Phoenix 2-1 that night, but we certainly did beat Phoenix that night. And I think there was definitely something there where the players feel a connection with the fans now that's stronger because they've seen how much the fans care. I love that. I and that that context is certainly helpful and 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 useful to us, but also you know all of our listeners. So Dan, we appreciate you so much for coming on and joining us today. Is there any final thoughts that you have? Anything? Uh, anything you want to? You know, you kind of you have the stage one last time if you want it. So I think the only thing would be obviously, and I know everyone is desperate to talk about you know the Americans playing in the games this weekend. So I just I think the final thing I'd want to say is a thank you 
to to you gentlemen for having us on the podcast to be able to tell our story and to the broader football community for the support they've shown. A football fan is a football fan, whatever level of football they're watching. And I'm, I've, we've been so proud to see everyone come together to support us. Uh, and we're grateful for everyone's support. Well, great. Thank you so much, Dan. Hands off to you. Thank and you appreciate so much. You joining us. All the best with, with, with how this plays out. And just know that you have two fans and Charlie and I, and uh, you know, we'll be following this along closely. So I appreciate you coming on telling us the story, giving us the, the a clear picture of what's happening. And we wish you all the best. Thank you. And I, I do hope America be at least one of Wales and Iran. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dan Rutstein, everyone. All right. Well, listen, Charlie, we're going to go to quick break. But when we come back, we are talking weekend in preview, not review. Uh, weekend in preview. So we'll be right back. Starfleet, get your Starfleet. Prepare for Warp 10 excitement. Yeah! This is an unauthorized launch. It is the greatest adventure of your life. Broken rocks are reading our nightmares, but I don't like my nightmares. Behold! So magical! Whatever happens, we're in this together. Welcome back to In Soccer We Trust. It's uh, myself, Hollywood Heath Pierce, and Charlie Chuck Wagon Davies, and of course, our friend Jimmy. Uh, cream cheese? No, it's not cream cheese anymore. It's Jimmy Trash Can Conrad, or Trash Can Jimmy Conrad, whichever way you want to say it, is uh, still in the United Kingdom. Uh, so we replaced him with a Brit on today's sh uh, show as, as our guest. But Jimmy's also uh, hanging out with all of the people from, um, from what's the, what, I'm blanking on the show, Charlie. Where, where Ted Lasso. It? Ted Lasso. How can I forget that? Uh, they're obviously in filming of their their final, I think it's their third season, third and final season, fourth and final yes. season. Um it's the, the last one, and Jimmy got a chance to go in and hang out with them with Coach Beard, so he's doing his thing today. Even claims, which we don't believe at this point, we don't that he might it. be making no. a cameo in this show, but he did preface it with, it'll probably get cut, a.k.a. Jimmy's not going to make a cameo. Uh, so Jimmy's hanging out with uh, Ted Lasso, but Charlie, we got to get into it because we've got a lot of people just chomping at the bit to talk about your boy, Tim Ream. Yes. Uh, so this this is, I think, the debate, right? Tim Ream is playing in the Premier League. He's the captain, 90 minutes, and Fulham are doing really well. Sounds right? a lot so, like Carlos Bocanegra was at one point, Charlie. Captain in captain of a, a Fulham for some matches, starting center back, left footed. Carlos Bocanegra also not a pacey defender. Uh I, I think there's I think there's a big difference between Bocanegra at that time and Tim Ream now. And also the game, the way the game is being played right now as well, in terms of like, we weren't, we were, I don't remember. Don't do, don't I mean, when that. we had don't, you, Charlie. Don't do, don't do that to Bogan. I'm not, like I'm not going to, no, but I'm saying, <laughs> I'm yeah. saying we played a little more neutral than the way Greg wants to play, right? We weren't, yeah. we weren't yeah. pressing every, every negative ball. We didn't, I mean, you move your lines, but we weren't, it wasn't about this transition game necessarily. I think it's similar in the way that we play in Carlos Bocanegra, Hall of Famer, an unbelievable player. Um, and again, not even in comparison in terms of quality, Tim Ream to Carlos Bocanegra. But what I'm saying is, Premier League player, starting, captain, mm -hmm. showing kind of value of a Premier League squad. Um, it would seem silly uh, if you were to remove all of the context that you and I know and others know to in the context being that he's he's older in age. He's not super fast. John Anthony Brooks is also a very similar quality of player had he gone to a, another club competing like this, um, that he should be in, a, in, in World Cup uh, contention or in at mm -hmm. least in contention to be called up into this, into this, next, um, into this next window. Yeah, I, I would say... You know, you look at the, the games he's played so far, right? 2-2 two, two against Liverpool. You're sitting back. You're defending. You're not allowing those players to get it behind. Darwin Nunez, Mohamed Salah. So you, you say, okay, you can compete against those guys when you're forced with sitting back and defending and anticipating where those balls are played. And then they played to a nil-nil draw versus Wolves. Wolves weren't able to score. And then they gave up two goals at home to Brentford winning 3-2. Now, that's great. He's captaining, he's playing, and he's an awesome person. I, I, that's one thing I always say. Tim Ream is a good person. Whether he's playing or not playing, you know what you're going to get from him. And that's why Greg Berhalter had him included him in, in the roster for so long. But, but with the way that Greg wants to play, he does not fit because Tim Ream will get isolated. And with, when Tim Ream is isolated, he does not have the pace he cannot turn around and track guys. Yes, he's got a great left foot, and he can build out of the back, but 
if you are tasked with pushing high, you are going to get torched. And if yeah. you catch Tim Ream on the sideline, see you later. That's just the reality we live in. So if that's what the coach wants to play, then unfortunately there are some players, regardless of how well they're doing, that aren't going to be included. That's because that's the coach's tactics and, and those are the demands of the sport. It's also this, Charlie. Fulham finished top of the championship. They were battering teams. They were beating teams. Tim Ream was in form all last season, right? And and during that window, the U.S. was playing. Tim Ream was getting called into, into camps. Greg's had a look at Tim Ream. This is not a form thing with Tim Ream. Yeah, there's the there is the no, it's not a form. The, the, there is the the added visuals of captaining a Premier League club. There's the added visuals of them getting results against the Liverpool. There's the added, you know, the, all of that stuff. It, it just seems like uh, temporary and I almost disrespectful because Tim Ream has been in great form since the start of last season. And he is the quality 100%. player that he is. And so I don't think we're seeing all of a sudden this emergence of Tim Ream to being a national team. Sure, he's in the national team conversation. But again, the way in which this team wants to play, the way in which this team has gelled and formed, could Tim Ream be on the plane with 26? Absolutely, yes, because he's got absolutely. the experience needed to do that. He's got the experience needed to be an important member uh, of this team. And and as I saw in here, a comment to close out a game if you had to, if you were defending deep and late. But Tim Ream, historically, and uh, has uh, is capable of the fatal error um, that, that could lead to a, a goal against, just like any center back is. But, but Tim Ream, because of that lack of pure pace to put out those fires or mistakes, can be punished for it differently. And I think... Greg knows that in terms, in, in, including Tim Ream's age. So, could he have a role in this national team? Yes, but is he in contention to be a starter in this national no. team? I, I I don't think so at all. But so, if we're looking at the depth chart, right? So you have Walker Zimmerman, even though he hasn't been playing well, he's probably still one on the depth chart. And then you have Chris Richards is two, I think, right now at Crystal Palace, and he's he's probably going to get some more games. And if he gets into a flow and he's starting for sure. Um, I still think Aaron Long is ahead of Cameron Carter Vickers, although Cameron Carter Vickers is coming up close and he might be pushing for a starting spot, especially if he does well in Champions League. Then you throw in James Sands, who we both saw has struggled mightily at center back, is out of the out of the question when it comes to in the midfield. So I don't want to see any any comments about uh, Sands versatility because all he can play is is a center back with the national team. On top of that. If he starts to build his his tactical IQ with his strength, because he is good with the, the at the ball uh, when the ball's at his feet, that might be the the player that could make it on the twenty six um, in, in in place of a Tim Ream. So if you're comparing those two players with with pace, about the same, I'd say yep. physique. I mean, Tim Ream's doing it now week in and week out at the Premier League, but can James Sands? do the same thing and then add it in the, in the, the uh, champions league qualifying. So then, and then you have Mark McKenzie on the outside looking in who's starting to play now. Maybe he gets into to a form and, and he's going to play. He's going to play every game now. Right. Uh, you know, they, they, they were three top center backs that they had sold one. He's going to be in that now, whether or not that's enough uh, in terms of him leaving that door open for others to come in uh, who knows, but it's not for lack of depth. You know, it's not for, I would love to have a left-footed center back uh, in that position, being able to play out and distribute. I, I personally find football way more entertaining when you have a left-footed center back there in your buildup because you're passing through lanes and it's a little bit more natural. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the way in which this national team plays has never really, I think Greg for a long time was trying that. He loved the idea of that. And I think it never really, and it wasn't for the lack of quality with John Anthony Brooks or Tim Ream on the ball, but just for a lack of like, the trade-off of what you give if you're not going to have that, if you're not going to dictate the style of play, if you're not going to be able to build through the midfield and, and and break down lines of passing and control the game from start to finish, the flip side is the risks of having those left-footed center backs who are who are not the paciest on our team. So I get that. Charlie, I don't want to stick too long on on uh, on Tim Ream, uh, and we will get to some of our other defenders, but let's let's start in the Premier League for our, our, our uh, sort of Americans uh, uh, abroad. Christian Pulisic, uh, Leicester uh, on on Saturday. Tyler Adams, Brendan Aronson play Brighton on Saturday. That one's been moved to 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 the uh, away from Peacock to to because just the exposure and has moved the other. I don't can't remember what the, I think it was maybe um can't remember what game it was that got moved over to Peacock from that one to put Tyler Adams and Brendan Aronson and Jesse Marsh on the big stage. Anthony Robinson, Tim Ream, 
uh, visit Arsenal and Chris Richards and, and Man City. Do any of those stand out to you? Do any of these players need to to kind of uh, get minutes, or or is this a crucial weekend for anybody in the Premier League? Well, it, I think for Christian, I, I would I would find it hard to believe if he doesn't start in this match against Leicester City. He he came in the 64th minute. They haven't been strong. Uh, I I feel like this is the time that Thomas Tuchel will give him an opportunity. Now that's why I would be watching this match because they also can't say he can't go. You can't leave, right. but we're also just never going to play you. You know, you're going to get 20 right. minutes here, and you're going to be happy about it. And then um, Crystal Palace is taking on Man City out on the road. Um, probably not an ideal game for Chris Richards to play in. So. <laughs> it, <laughs> Um, that'll be interesting. It'll, have a great, then, it'll be a great life experience, Charlie, if he does. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, you know, Hoffenheim is, is playing Augsburg, Augsburg. So can Ricardo Pepe, who finally got some good time off the bench, do, does he look to get a little bit more? And does he, does he capitalize with that time? Yeah. If it's 15 minutes, if it's 20 minutes, what 30 minutes, make sure that you leave a mark and get on the score sheet or just be impactful so that y- you continue to get those minutes and, and build it into something. Um, I think well, we me, have to talk ask, about let, Jordy Pifolk. Well, th- th- this is the thing. Just thematically, we came off of a really strong weekend re- last weekend, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Ricardo Pepe out of that. In terms of goal scorers, contributors, Gio Reyna coming back. Now we're going into this weekend, and thematically, it could still be a great weekend, but it certainly seems like most of our players are taking on some pretty tough opponents. Joe Scally against Bayern Munich. Uh, Kevin Paredes playing Leipzig. PFOC against Schalke. You know, uh, Timmy Chandler against Werder Bremen. Again, I'm talking about Werder Bremen and Schalke in terms of the size of the club and their starts to the season. But, you know, just generally, and then you go back to the Premier League clubs that, that I mentioned, you've got uh, Palace against City. You've got uh, Fulham against Arsenal. You've got, you know, Chelsea against Leicester. It's a, it's a challenging weekend for for a lot of our players uh, in, in the leagues that I just mentioned. Um, sorry, ju- just wanted to give a little bit of context in terms of like we had a high high last weekend. Wouldn't be surprised if maybe not performance wise, but maybe performance wise, um, um, the results didn't go our way for, for most of our players. No, I mean, uh, but there's some interesting matchups. So, you know, Valencia at Atletico Madrid or hosting Atletico Madrid. I, I want to see if Yunus Musa can now continue to 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 play for Valencia if he gets the start and then and then do something and this is against Atletico Madrid so you're talking about a team that is is very disciplined um if he can create and and get a, a win out of that that's a a very uh inspiring performance uh potentially and then you have um you know I'm looking at the lineup that I have I have like a a, a depth chart in each position Brent Aronson Tim Weah Gio Reyna right Yunus Musa, all of those four all those four players are, are competing for two spots. So it, it's interesting because you you have to watch them week by week to see how they're doing, how they're progressing, how many minutes they're playing. Um, it's crazy. And then you know, seeing if Luca De La Torre gets some minutes against uh, Girona um, this weekend, and, and Tati Castellanos has been playing really well. Hey, here, here's here's a question for you, Charlie. Uh, Georgi Mihailovic obviously signs in in Holland. Um, is, is there a, do you think that it changed that he's going to stay with the club till the end of the year and then go over in January? Do you think that's changed his odds of getting back into the national team? Obviously he had an injury. Do you think he's kind of a little bit too late of an emergence with his form this season to, or do you think a move, what do you think that move immediately could, could have helped that or. Well, it, it could have, it could have tremendously hurt it and yeah, yeah it could have helped, but I think going into any team um in in Europe from MLS there's an adjustment period we 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 always see it and so that adjustment period would carry into the world cup so ideally you, you don't want to be in a situation where you're not going to play and so for Georgi Mihailovic i think it's more important for greg to know okay his ambition is going to europe he's going to be playing in europe long term fantastic this could be an incredible move for him in the short term he's playing every week against uh, for a Montreal side that's second in the Eastern Conference. He's mm-hmm. flying. If he continues to do this, I, I could see him very well being in the, in the camp. I wouldn't be surprised if he's in that September camp as well. And that'll be a good, a good audition for Greg to say, how far has he come? Is he ready for this level? 
Yeah. Hey, Charlie, here, here's a, a, something that I'm just reading actually in the comments. So I, I've yet to fact check it, but Arena, Arena didn't travel again uh, for, for this weekend. And uh, so he, he, he plays in, in the home matches, but he doesn't seem to travel on the road. He's got the old Thierry Henry, don't play on turf uh, type of thing. But no, I he's mean, too young for that. Yeah, I know. He's not. He's such a nice kid, dude, Gio. Um, but uh, do you think there's something to that? Is this sort of the right way? I mean, you're a doctor, Charlie. Is this the right way to uh, kind of bring somebody back in as home games only at the moment? Or is it just more about monitoring? I mean, it's, just, it's a little bizarre um, week to week if, if you look at it without any context. Yes. I mean, well, we don't know if there maybe was a slight injury in training. We don't know if it was an illness. It could be it could be him being sick. Or it could just be load management. Load but he, management, but he played like a month. He played four games ago, and then he didn't travel. No, no, sorry. He was on the bench for a home game. He played game. last, last didn't match. Yeah. W was on the bench for a home game. Didn't travel a few days later for the away game. And then he played last match and then mm -hmm. isn't traveling again for this game. So there's a little bit of a theme there. The, yeah, there is. I, I would like to to think it's just load management and, and just easing him back into it because – he, he went from not playing at all to getting considerable minutes off the bench. And it was a disastrous result being up two nil and then losing three, two. So, um, well, I Dr. just know he's a great you, had, you heard, you heard it here first, Dr. Chuck wagon, load management, load is management. The, it's the new, that's the, uh, you know, it's funny is I did a, uh, LAFC game, uh, broadcast recently and, and it had the player availability reports and Chiellini was, was unavailable just due to load, load management. That's the new trending term right now is load management is just load the management. way to, it covers the whole, it can be anything, but as long as you put it in there, no problem, you know, at least addresses things for people of like, yeah, legs are a little bit tired, but uh, <laughs> now we got people calling you Dr. Chuck wagon, which I I'm okay. I appreciate with. it. Uh, Christopher yeah. Walken. Yeah. Um, so, you know, moving, moving across, uh, you know, some of the other play, uh, places, as, as we mentioned, Cameron Carter Vickers uh, are playing against Ian Harks and Dundee. Uh, you've got Malik Tillman and James Sands uh, playing against Ross County. Not massive. I mean, Dundee's a, a big club, but not massive. No, none of those games are massive unless it's Ranger Celtic. Let's just be real. Let's call it what it is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then, okay, well, well let's talk about uh, uh, Otisowi, uh, Club Bruges uh, against uh, Sporting Charlois. Uh, Mark McKenzie is playing against Sarang. Uh, Sam Vines playing against Royal Antwerp. A lot of, there was a lot of shouts in our chat about Sammy Vines getting called back in mm -hmm. um, just in terms of his quality. I couldn't validate that because I, ha I, full transparency, I haven't been watching all of his games. There's just only so many games you can watch on a weekend. But um, if somebody wants to spend their weekend chopping up all of his touches, I'll certainly watch it and give my, uh, Actually, all of his movements just track him for ninety minutes. But well, what do you uh, think it, about his play in general? I mean, just when you have seen him, even with the Rapids, what what what's his potential? What's his ceiling? I mean, he's a technical player. I I think he's an explosive player too in terms of his 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 kind of movement in and around the ball, in and out tight space. Actually, reminds me a little bit of what uh, you know George Bell will have or Sergio Desk, kind of smaller frames, but kind of good, tidy and tight spaces. Uh, but again, I, I haven't been able to really assess what's been the growth because he is a young player. You can see growth when put into new challenging environments, or you can see sort of backtracking when putting into those cha challenging environments coming from one that maybe wasn't as challenging. So it's hard for me to see what the I don't think he has a huge ceiling in terms of taking Anthony Robinson's spot, just because I think Anthony has all the same things, plus a little bit bigger of an engine, plus a bigger frame and a little bit more... You know, he's kind of just incrementally better across the board, which is what's got him this uh, secure spot. So, but Royal Antwerp aren't a tiny club. And, you know, uh, it, it's hard to say. I mean, our player pool is pretty deep. I just, again, continue to think about like, do we want a backup left back? Do we need a backup left back or are we good? Can Joe Scally be that? Do we really think Sergio Dest is the backup left back in a bind when he's our starting right back? Like, is we we've seen him... He's not particularly unbelievable at is left back. Is he the starting right back for you if he doesn't play until November? Let's just say he's stuck uh, in that Barcelona I situation. I don't know, man. DeAndre Yedlin's weirdly the best I've ever seen him in terms of a complete player. DeAndre Yedlin to me was like a lot of our high potential players for the longest time, right? Which was like, he could kill you on speed. On. Yeah. yeah, he he. You couldn't you couldn't get to him. 
it reminded me of, of, of a Marvell win and these people that just had unbelievable pace and so much raw material to shape and mold into a complete player. And very rarely do you get the complete player of anybody, right? You, you see that potential early on. He was identified super early on. It's like, look at the raw material we have to work with. We can shape this or engineer this into being a complete player. He could be somebody that plays, and that's obviously why he's had the trajectory of the career that he's had. Um, but now I'm seeing him in this form where, where he is a little bit more stay-at-home. He can get forward. He does have more of a, a ability to put in a decent ball when he gets, on the, gets down to the touchline. All those pieces that he's developed over time, plus his defensive ability, make me more comfortable um, with him potentially playing. And, and it's hard to create a scenario where Sergio does play zero and Yedlin plays until the start of the World Cup. But those are the two players I'm, I'm looking at. So if Sergio Dest doesn't play, it would be hard for me to assume that he would have, one, the, the confidence or, or ability to step straight into a World Cup and deliver, right? He has the talent, but does he have the confidence and all those other pieces that come with that? I mean, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I would say, one, um, Sergio Dest is, is not great defensively. That, that's, that's a known fact. He is in a, a phenomenal attacking right fullback. Well, that Everyone alone might be that. As a right back, opponent a specific, boom. specific then. So maybe you're you're thinking opponent specific in a World Cup anyway, because yes, you know if, we if, always, if, we've talked about this a lot. You bring 26 players, you're probably going to play 22 of them. Um, even though we always think it's going to be 11 plus three players, it's never that, you know. No, it's not. And so, like, yes, if you're on the front foot, you're pressing teams, you have majority of possession. That's when Sergio Dest is great. Look at when he was playing for Ajax; they dominated the Eredivisie. And he's always in, in the attacking third as a right back. Then same with, with Barcelona, but you're also forced to defend a little bit more. And Xavi did not like the his his defensive with his defensive responsibilities. Typically you you weren't getting what you were expecting out of, of Sergio Dest. Now, if you look at DeAndre Yedlin, and I see some people saying, like, oh, Yedlin's been bad. No, when I've watched DeAndre Yedlin in MLS, he's been good. And on top of that, he's one of the only players with World Cup experience. And he's only probably the only player that, ha that has played with Harry Kane and against Harry Kane. So you're talking about guys that he's familiar with playing in the Premier League when he was at Newcastle. Yes. I mean, it, it would make sense to get Yedlin a run. I mean, you talk about pace alone. Yes, he he's he's one of those guys who can who can make those recovery runs. And do all that. You don't need Yedlin to provide these crazy crosses and. Hey, serves. we're getting crushed, Charlie. We're getting crushed by the comments on our takes on Yedlin. You know, like oh uh, my gosh, we are. We're getting crushed, but but it's it's guys. We're, we're, we created a condition in all of this. We're not comparing Sergio Dest to DeAndre Yedlin. That is not what the conversation is. You need to uh, take it into context. That Charlie's question was, do you start Yedlin if Dest does not play until the World Cup? I'm not confident starting Christian Pulisic if he doesn't play until the World Cup. And he's our sure he's the number he's the first player you put into the lineup. But Charlie De and I Dest and, is and not better than De Dest is not better defensively than Yedlin. I can no. tell you that right now. That's no just a, that's a that's not even close. Yeah. Um but I mean I see all these 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 comments for me if you had to choose on just defending alone Yedlin over Dest defending alone now, the U.S., when we play a lot of teams in CONCACAF, we dominate possession. That's It's expected that the teams are going to sit back. Mm -hmm. That's when you want Sergio Dest because you, you have another option, someone who's creative, someone who can come in and score goals on, the, on their own, but also someone who can play balls, who can, who can cross it, who is dangerous. But um, right now, I mean, people will say Joe Scally's playing every week. Well, Joe Scally, I, you all got to see him play this summer. He wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. That's that's it. He's not ready. He can, I, play, unfortunately, he can play every game, but if you get to the international stage and you're not ready, you're not ready. Yeah, and and look, it, Dest in a daily environment at Barcelona is better than the national team. Dest playing against Valladolid is not better than the international level, right? Like Valladolid as a level, like it's there is there is MLS not the international level. The Bundesliga is not the international level. The game is different. The pace is different. The expectations, the pressure, the nerves, everything that comes with that. It's not that Joe Scali isn't a national team player. He just wasn't ready to take that next step yet. Now I agree that if Yedlin, uh, it, it, we are screwed if if Yedlin is our answer is the comment. I don't necessarily agree with that because I think Yedlin 
will be dialed in in a way that 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 he wasn't. Yes, he made the. I think it was against Canada where he fell asleep on the throw in. You know, we okay. know that he's had moments in let's, the past. Let's go back he, to that though. Canada, Tayshawn Buchanan, Alfonso Davies, Jonathan David, Kyle Kyle Laren. Who weren't they toasting? Mm-hmm. You had to be at, at your ten of ten game. You had to be playing at the highest level and on point in that match because those players are burning everybody in Concacaf. There, there was no one excluded. All the Mexican players, all the the U.S. players, all all the Hondurans, all all the Jamaicans. That that was consistent throughout World Cup qualifying. So if people wow. say, "Man, De- DeAndre wasn't there against Canada," well, not too many people were. Shoot. Yeah, I know. It, I mean, it's, it's that's what happens. Defenders fail, right? When defenders do well, they don't get talked about. You you only get talked about when you, when you kind of mess up. You know, unlike these strikers like Charlie, that he, are selfish he wasn't a like, he wasn't a at, young MLS or yeah. Christopher. Come on, man. Dejan yeah. was was a baller. That's why he got a ten a, a ten million dollar uh, price on his head because he was absolutely killing everybody in Major League Soccer. He was an absolute beast. And and then he got his move to Canada, and he was absolutely de- dominating people in Concacaf. So. Uh, well, let me, Tejan, let me, Tejan's the real deal. Well, William says he disagrees. If Dest doesn't fit, he would start Cannon. Cannon is a viable option. I just haven't seen enough for Cannon to, 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 in my personal opinion, separate him from, from either. But, you know, again, time will tell. And we're going to have DeAndre Yedlin on the show uh, in the next month or so. So uh, we'll ask him straight up. You know, we'll, we'll ask him, hey, can you defend? Can you defend better uh, than, than uh, yeah. Virginia Dest? <laughs> Say it. Yeah. Say it. Say, Say it, it with your chest. Uh, but listen, Charlie, before we wrap up the show and, and, and by the way, everyone in the comments, uh, we appreciate everything you guys are saying. We love the Absolutely. conversation. It's a great debate. And and that's why we, 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 we've got the show is to create a platform where we can all share and have a two-way dialogue. So keep those comments coming in. There's this controversy right now. And I don't know if it's just rumor mill or how legitimate it is. It just seems like there's a lot going on about Alex and Dejas and about not being called into the next uh, Mexico uh friendlies about the fact that maybe he didn't file the one-time switch. He's obviously capable of playing for the U S or, or Mexico, um, that he has played in friendlies for Mexico. He played for the youth national team. So he would have to file the switch. People are wondering, there's also this uh, rumor that he had uh, Mexico asked him to sign this document of like, um, you know, uh, undying loyalty document basically. Um, and so uh, what, what's your take Charlie, if anything on, on this subject, uh, because it seems like we're still, waiting for more information to come out of did he file the, did they file the one time switch if so then then what's the, what all of this is just nonsense um what is yeah. this document because there was a there was a, the suggestion um coming from our friend Viso Vasquez who talked to to uh, Hercules Gomez who said that there is there is no documents that both the US and Mexico sign of like whatever this like signature is of like not the official switch but that you're 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 going to you know stay with him so i mean what what's your take on this overall to be honest, I I have I, I could care less about what what Mexico does and doesn't do and who they've registered and who have. If this was Di- Diego Lainez and he could play for the United States, I'd say, oh yeah, yeah, he, they they were illegal. They didn't do it. I could care less about this situation. If if this was a a, a massive player that was going to make or break, you know, Concacaf for the next ten years, five years, then I would have I, I would care. But at this point, I'm like whatever happens happens like do your thing uh, this doesn't doesn't move the needle for me okay that's fair i mean uh, <laughs> yeah. for 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 i mean for me in terms of a, a a player of of i guess this quality um at doing well at uh club america it's a big club big pressure i'm just I'm not speculating on whether or not there's something to do with the U S on this. It just feels like maybe there's a little pie in the face potential moment for Mexico of having not filed it or, or it's just rumors, you know, and we're just getting caught up in all this, which, you know, this, this probably takes place daily uh, in the Mexican tabloids and, and, and it's just getting to us because it's about um, because it's about a, a dual national. So I'm not really sure wh- where this is going to take. If anybody has any, any uh, actual insight or context into, into this Zendejas situation, let us know. Uh, in the comments and or shoot us a comment on uh, on Twitter or social media or whatever. Um, Charlie, uh, we're getting down to the end of it. Any, any final thoughts uh, about uh, Americans, not necessarily abroad, but previewing players' uh, matches to watch this this weekend? I've got uh, LAFC obviously playing against uh, uh, Austin. Uh, big mm-hmm. game with with uh, Supporter Shield implications between 
these two teams going on this evening. Uh, that's one for me to watch uh, as well. But is there any any in terms of uh, matches to watch, players to watch this weekend, or or or, or matchups that you want to see? All right, Christopher Watkins, right? We got my ten minute final thought here. Yeah, no, final final uh, forty. <laughs> Seattle, Portland, that's a big one. Um, but what I will say is, I respect everybody in the comments who 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 cares because you're showing what you think. These are these are debates. These are things that you we want to talk about. The right back situation is a big one, especially when Sergio Dest is not playing. One when, when he's playing, we already know defensively it's a liability. So when he's not playing, that's a real question. Does he still play if he's not playing? Christian Pulisic, yes, you can give the nod to, but Sergio Dest, I'm not so sure if he's already earned 100% the right back spot in in a World Cup. And then. You know, I, I just respect everybody who who cares, who's 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 making comments, who wants to have these debates and, and ha- hear what we have to say. So, uh, respect and much love. Wow, Charlie, that that's it. That's all you got left for us. Well, as a reminder, everybody, real quick before we uh, before we break this whole thing down, uh, Paramount Plus is the only place to stream every minute of every Serie A match, and you can quickly and easily sign up for your very own account right now. With a one-month free trial by going to ParamountPlus.com forward slash Italy. Just click Try It Free button. Use the promo code Italy for instant access uh, to the best Italian club soccer available across all of your devices. Visit ParamountPlus.com forward slash Italy and start your streaming. That is it for us here at In Soccer We Trust. Of course, we will be right back with you again on Monday, Thursday, and Friday of next week. So make sure you're following us across all of our social media platforms to stay up to date on everything that's going on, who the next potential guest is, as well as make sure you're leaving us a five-star review and a comment. Go review right now. Five stars. Say nice things. Say nice things about Charlie. (laughs) Say nice things about me and Jimmy. And until next time, that is it from us. Thank you so much to our producers and Charlie Chuck Wagon Davies for joining me today. And of course, Jimmy Conrad for not joining us. So Charlie and I had more time to just make this about us. So until next time, see you guys later. We'll be right back.